Hello and welcome and thank you to our hosts over at EGX Rest for hosting this panel on gaming burnout. Now, I want to just do a content warning for this panel because we are talking about mental health topics, so that may bring up issues regarding mental health which may be challenging for you, so please just consider that before deciding to watch this whole thing uh, or watch in a safe way if you wish to. Um, now, what is this panel about? We hear a lot about burnout these days, don't we? Especially in the workplace. And yep. as gamers and gaming fans, we have seen in the news issues about crunch in the games that are developed for us. And we kind of want more and more for our games to be made in an ethical way. So we don't want our games to be made by people who go through burnout when they're making the games. But what about when we're playing the games? We are starting to hear more and more about gaming burnout in terms of as a hobby. Like, I do you get so tired of gaming that it becomes like a chore? Well, today we're going to talk about that, whether that really is burnout and what that means for your mental health so that you can make sure that you do what you love while protecting your mental health. I am Sachin Shah. I am a mental health doctor, pronouns he, him, and I am part of Gaming the Mind, a charity dedicated to improving the mental health of gamers. And I would like to introduce, firstly, her name is Stephanie Miner. She is an editor over at The Gamer, and in addition to covering gaming news, she writes really interesting thought pieces, including on her personal experiences in playing games. And then we have uh, Shunxiang Sin Phailam, and he is a mental health doctor. Uh, I call him Phailam, and he is a fellow member of Gaming the Mind. And burnout is a particular interest of his, so hopefully we'll get some cool insights on burnout from him. Stephanie, I want to start with you. You wrote an article about games starting to feel like work for you, and I've read a few accounts of how this can happen for people who play games as their job so you know you play games as your job as a journalist and what is your work schedule like in terms of having to play games so um i pretty much started out without any schedule whatsoever um over time it kind of just turned into something without really being planned um initially i thought that on the days that i had actual work those are the days that i should try to play you know games for fun so to say you know not the obligatory games um however that kind of resulted in all of my free days still feeling like work because those were the days i had you know to try to keep up with new releases and stuff like that um so at the end uh, i actually found that what worked better for me was um playing the games that I felt like I should be playing on the same days that I have work and then keeping my other days as open as possible to just play the games that I like for enjoyment. So that's kind of been my schedule lately. So um, trying to keep that work-life balance, even though both things are, involve a similar pastime, basically. Right, right, exactly. What sort of games do you play when you're playing what you want to play? <laughs> um, well, so my favorite type of games are JRPGs. Um, I really, really like the turn-based combat strategy type games, um, though I will always have a soft spot for Skyrim. I continuously go back to that game because I cannot help myself. So, um, But uh, I guess fantasy games in general are, I really like. You know, So like The Witcher 3 is another one of my favorites, even though it's not a JRPG, but that's typically what I gravitate towards. So, I mean, those even as enjoyment games are ones that involve quite a lot of time <laughs> sync, right? Yes. Uh, but but uh, obviously it just feels like a different context, I suppose. But what's it like when you're working with games for games to start to feel like work? What does that feel like? Well, um, in a way, it, it's a little devastating, actually, um, because so my whole life I've been extremely into video games. I've loved them since I was very little. Um, and even games that, you know, I never really was extremely into. So let's say um, Call of Duty. I used to play that with my dad sometimes and um, wasn't super into it, but I still found enjoyment in it. But now those types of games and not just first person shooters, um, but 
uh, a lot of the newer games, like sci-fi games and stuff, I'm not as into. And it, it feels awful to not be able to find at least some enjoyment in it now because it feels strictly like work nowadays. Um, and so it's just... It's been hard for me because video games have been such an aspect of my personality, you know, like who I consider myself to be a gamer growing up and just feeling that kind of slide away a little bit has been really hard to deal with. And it's not the games that have changed, it's it's sort of how you feel about them. Right, right. I don't think it's that the games have changed. I mean, games have changed in some ways, but I definitely don't think it's because of that that I've been dealing with these feelings. I think it's definitely a me thing. I mean, Phylam, uh, this maybe, you know, has a tinge of burnout to it in terms of what we think of as burnout. But could we, could you just explain to us what burnout is broadly? Okay, so I guess the first thing to stress is um, what is burnout is that burnout has been defined by the World Health Organization. And just really strictly by their, their criteria, it is associated with work. That's how they, they have defined it as such. Um, I think there's sometimes a bit of a confusion around this because people think that uh, burnout as an entity is considered as an illness, but WHO has been quite clear that they don't consider it illness, they consider it part of occupational health issues. And I think sometimes it's interesting to think back to the past, and such. And if I do ramble on, do ask me to shut up, and I'm fine <laughs> with that as well, because I tend to talk a bit about it. But the concept of burnout initially was derived from... Um, they were referring to people who were using illicit substances in the 1970s and this sense of burnout of using long-term heroin usage, long-term cocaine usage, and burning right. out. Like a nasty word. It yes. Was burnout, it, it, it was, wasn't it? It, yeah, it was a burnout. So it was, it was a colloquial term. It's wildly in, inappropriate. But um, there was an American psychologist called Freudenberg, I'm probably pronouncing it wrongly, who used it to describe staff members who are working in the substance misuse clinics. It was a very fascinating sort of concept. He described feelings of exhaustion, you know, feeling of cynicism, feeling of ineffectiveness. And, and he was describing the staff. And the interesting thing which he talked about amongst the staff, and we can go into this a bit later on, is that um, the reference point was always, and it still sometimes is a narrative today, is that the people who burn out are the ones who can't make it, can't hack it within the specialty or within the field. But he actually identified, and this is going back to the very first conceptualization of burnout, was that the people who burn out are the ones who care, the ones who actually give a damn. Mm. Um, actually give. Uh, <laughs> more, more of a, um, and he said that it was, it was this, this, sort of, this sort of thing where you're giving and you're giving and giving and giving more of your time, giving more of your energy, trying to just cope with this overwhelming rush of, of work. And feeling that what you're doing is not enough that leads to burnout, that leads to you feeling this is this is insufficient. So it so the people who are likely to get stressed out by work maybe are the ones with more passion for it or put too much into it, for example. Yes. And I think um it's interesting because we talk about burnout and a lot of the research often focus around um the medical profession. But there's actually a lot of research into the gaming industry as well. And both professions often attract people who have for a lot of their lives worked towards that goal. So you Mm. don't sort of just float into the gaming industry. I feel I do correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie. Um, I don't think I don't think you're wrong. (laughs) No, I I think something which people actively pursue is the active dream. Same for medicine, same for a lot of other specialties as well of jobs is something which you sort of aspire to when you're young and then you start working into it with that passionate view of it and actually discover that you're trying to stem a tide of, of feeling exhausted and ineffective and it burns I think you that, out. I think that something that, you know, um, comes from that, you know, uh, the, the passion side of the industry, Stephanie, is that like, say someone is overworked in your line of work or any sort of gaming line of work, you almost have to have this mindset of, but you're lucky to be here. Right, Right. exactly. Yeah, Yeah. that's exactly what it's like. And that's something I tell myself on a frequent basis. But then I always have to go back and revisit it and tell myself, you know, 
no, it, it's actually okay to feel a little bit burnt out and a little bit frustrated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's a pep talk I have on a normal basis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's probably something that employers do to their employees too, which is that, you know, well, you're in your dream job. <laughs> you, know, you, better <laughs> appre- you better appreciate it, that kind of thing, if, if you have any complaints. Uh, I mean, Fai, you, you've just uh, covered, you know, the three dimensions, well, three listed dimensions of burnout, which are, you know, exhaustion, ineffectiveness and cynicism. Mm-hmm. And and you mentioned that, you know, burnout is just known as a work phenomenon, but maybe we can think of it as other things, but not as far as the World Health Organization is concerned. So that's a good disclaimer to put. Stephanie, just to, with regards to that, the, the dimensions of burnout, can I ask you about exhaustion? Like, have you ever felt like physically tired with regards to gaming? Yes. And um, a lot of people will talk about being mentally tired. And um, it, from my experience, um, they're often not really different. Uh, the mental exhaustion often makes me feel physically exhausted. Um, but oftentimes what happens is I, I don't actually realize that I'm exhausted until I've spent a lot of time or, you know, several days in a row not playing any games. And then it kind of hits me and I'm like, you know, I have I haven't done anything. I've just been kind of you know re- trying to relax. It's like this constant trying to relax so I can get back to a spot where I feel like I can play games again. And it kind of turns into this bad cycle. It's really difficult to navigate through. Mm. I mean, if I, uh, does that ring any bells? Like, how, in terms of the exhaustion side of things, uh, what's going on in burnout? Well, yes, it, it definitely rings very true. Um, this sense of fighting against the tide this is often described as well um because it's i think stephanie sort of conceptualized it extremely well is this sort of vicious cycle you feel exhausted so you can't do the work of which you want to do then you put even more energy into it then you feel even more exhausted because you have no time to actually step back and go no let's take a pause there and I, i think that's interesting because this is just being from a very cynical view of of why burnout is so important from the individual's perspective. Of course, it's important. It's your well-being, it's your health. I think we can't deny that. But from a corporate perspective, from a, 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 a business perspective, burnout, and I think that's why I sometimes get quite irritated when I hear sort of... Um, colleagues telling others that, oh, yeah, you, you know, you should be glad to be here and you should work all these crazy hours because all you're doing is just feeding the cycle um, of making people mm-hmm. exhausted. You get poor quality work coming out because people are exhausted. That's the bottom line. Um, and and, and yeah. so, uh, so a part of the burnout issue is actually employers going, well, how can we work our employees harder without yeah. breaking them? Yes. Basically. And when it doesn't work that way because exhausted employees can't work as well. I mean, if we think about even in the fields of sports, in the fields of other aspects, they talk about uh, uh, load management, you know, managing people's time, managing people's uh, amount of uh, hours they put in. This is even in like professional top in sports. It's it's because a lot of organizations recognize now that you can't work people 100 hours a week and expect them to be able to come out with the same sort of work quality. Mm. And what's even sadder is that you're making people who are passionate about a field lose that passion. Mm. And I think that's extremely sad. Sorry. Um, oh, so, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, comment on that. Um, one thing that's been really great about working with the gamer is that um, my boss actually, uh, we've we've talked about this topic before. Um, so he's actually raised that to us. So even um, during the recent E3 stuff, when, you know, <laughs> that whole weekend into the week was really intense and mm. um, definitely higher risk, I think, of burnout mm. during that time. Um, he was actually very aware of it. And um, he he told people to leave early, you know, as soon as we got done, because he he expressed to us his concerns about burnout and stuff. So I'm hoping Mm -hmm. that's an indicator that, you know, at least somewhere in the industry, you know, people are starting to actually realize this and take it seriously. Yeah, and I think it's really good because, you know, the gamer and other gaming outlets will be covering burnout a lot. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, they got to sort of practice what they preach to some degree. But it also just shows this great awareness, doesn't it? Um, 
Um, Steph, uh, Stephanie, I want to ask you. Sorry, I keep shortening it to Steph. Uh, if you want to call me Steph, that's totally fine. <laughs> well, thank you, Steph. I want to ask you about um, cynicism towards gaming and negative feelings towards gaming, because that's the other dim- another dimension of burnout. Have you ever? I mean, you've already hinted towards you know changing feelings towards games. Have you ever felt like cynical towards them? Um, yes, actually, um, especially after joining the industry, um, because, you know, what it used to be is I was alone in my room, I'd sit down for hours, play games by myself, and just kind of get into the magic of all of it. Um, but now that I've been in the industry, um, it's not only full of having to write articles where I have to, you know, critique games, so I'm actively looking for things in the games that, you know, aren't great or, you know, whatever, um, but also the, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of great people in the industry, but there's also a lot of not so great people in the industry. And so there's lots of negativity. You know, you've got like console wars going on and just all this all this extra stuff that wasn't really a part of my life before being in the industry that definitely has made me much more cynical about all of it and i feel like when i play games now it's almost like i'm looking at them with a different pair of eyes than i did before it's really like just bringing in this toxic element to something that you're you know meant to love basically right i I mean what what do you reckon Vi? Uh, i mean yes it's it's strange isn't it because the relationship when you you pull back the curtains is almost like a wizard of odds (laughs) <laughs> back the curtains and you go yeah oh oh god there's a lot of other things going <laughs> behind this to to make this illusion which i used to enjoy so much um and i think that's just the other thing because sometimes it's hard to split the end product from everybody else who's working to achieve it um so as a consumer as i'm i'm, I'm just a video game consumer which is great mm. for me so i don't <laughs> know when I play a game, I go, oh, this is a great game. I really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, I'm a lot more aware because of Sachin's efforts as well of sort of like um, things like uh, the crunch and stuff like that. So I become a lot more aware of in practices which are, are, are not optimal, practices which are bad and, 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 and should be stopped. Uh, but I'm just really mindful when I was a lot younger. It's when you play a game, you just go, this is a great game. I'm enjoying this so much. It magically appeared in my mailbox one it magically appeared one day and I got to play it. I think yeah. uh, and this gets into uh, probably some tips that we might get up, get up to later, but like I am finding as I get older, I'm also just losing a lot of time for games. And so Definitely. like, yeah, so like, you know, you like JRPG stuff, so do I. And like, I just don't have the investment <laughs> time for that. But like something that still uh, sparks me is watching other people play and yeah. and sort of feeding off their enthusiasm for games that I've already played, for example. Yeah, I've definitely heard other people say that before too. I think that's a common tactic that people use to sit down and watch other people play. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. How... oh, sorry. Uh, let's, let's hit that final burnout indicator mm-hmm. uh, of a loss of efficacy or a loss of feeling of efficacy. Like I understand this in the workplace, right? Which is that you, you know, you're not productive anymore which gets into Phylam's sort of like uh maybe cynical view of what burnout is because one of the criteria is they're not working hard enough (laughs) but uh but like how might that manifest as a gamer Steph like um have you felt yourself sort of losing steam in terms of your productivity um yes um so actually it, it was kind of ironic um you would think that getting into the video game industry would mean that I'm playing more games than before, but um, as it turns out, I'm actually playing less games than before. And there's definitely this endless pressure to be playing more um, because, you know, even if I'm not actually reviewing the games, I need to have content that I can write about and that requires, you know, playing more. So um, it's definitely been much more difficult nowadays to actually get through as many games as I used to get through. You know, you know that whole aspect of I need to have content just made me think of like people who stream or people who uh, do in real in real life streams, for example, and how tied to the camera they feel because they need to 
keep producing and they sort of get disillusioned with their own lives at some point yeah. um not as a rule but you hear about these people who are like i need to take a break and just live a normal life for, for, for yeah, a while definitely. uh phylam uh tell us about uh, reduced efficacy and burnout i should put my cards on the table um a little bit on this my view of burnout it always gets a bit muddy because although the narrative the story is always about the individual. I do actually strongly believe it's about the system upon which you're working within that mm. impacts it burnout even more. Um, so when we talk about sense of ineffectiveness, it's the sense that what you're doing is, is not effective. It's the sense that what you're doing is not contributing. It's not of value, which sometimes makes it feel. Um, and I think there was an interesting article by um, Harvard, Business Review, I think, which talked about this and about the causes of burnout. And primarily the things we should talk about are things like poor communication between staff members, between higher management and within staff, um, you know, a feeling that you, are, you have a lack of clarity, lack of roles, um, unfair treatment, unmanageable workloads. All of these things are things which have been highlighted as contributory factors to burnout. But the narrative which we always have here about burnout is about the individual when actually it's about the often it's about system in place around the individual that impacts yeah. them more. Well, um, I think we we'll, I think we might get onto that when we talk about like, is there a cure for burnout? Because, yeah. well, yeah. as we'll see, the cure is probably up there rather than yes. down here. Right. Yes. Uh, but but we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll find yeah. out about that. Um, I, I want to ask about the another mental health side to this uh i mean stephanie you wrote about the fact that these feelings of detachment and cynicism and you know exhaustion from games are can occur in the context of it also being your job i've i've read um from other um uh people who work in games who've also said you know this game actually uh, this this career is burning me out on games but then there's another aspect which you mentioned, which was that this can also occur within the context of depression, right? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so way before I even got into this industry at all, um, I would go through time periods experiencing the same kind of thing. Um, it's easier for me to talk about burnout now as like a solid concept because I can connect it to, you know, oh, well, I'm in the industry, so this happens. Whereas earlier in life, it, it wasn't so clear to me. It felt more like, why is there something wrong with me that I can't pick up these games that I love? Um, that definitely happened. Um, so it's not just with games, but depression can seep into every aspect of your life, every hobby, everything that you love. Um, so for example, I am very into writing, um, aside from my job, like fantasy writing, poetry writing, that kind of stuff. Um, it never felt like work until one day suddenly it did, you know, and there was seemingly no real explanation until further down the line, I realized that I was struggling with depression and it's an ongoing struggle. And I think, you know, it's going to be lifelong. So it's been hard to deal with, but I've I've been trying to deal with it and find some ways to to cope, but I think you said we were going to get to that later. So, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, spoiler alert: we will help you out with some <laughs> of these feelings or at home if you're watching. Uh, but, um, I think it's interesting because you know we took when we assess people with depression. I think one of the major things we look for is loss of enjoyment and stuff. And maybe as a clinician, I get too wrapped up in, um, oh, but you're still doing X, Y, and Z, so you still have enjoyment. I'm wondering, Stephanie, even when you had depression, did you lose interest in games but keep playing them, or did you not go near them? It was it was a combination. Sometimes um, there were times that I just wouldn't go near them at all. Um, but there's there's definitely, I think, depression hits differently at different times. So sometimes it can be completely overwhelming to where you're totally immobile and feel like you can't do anything. Whereas other times it's almost like you can still make yourself do the tasks, but they don't feel the same way that they did before or that you think they're supposed to feel. So it was right. kind of a combination. I mean, what did that feel like, if I may ask? Uh, just because I guess 
to to us maybe if we're feeling low in a you know average day to day life, uh, gaming might be a cool coping mechanism. It might be a nice a nice little escape. And if that felt that way to you, or if you wanted to turn to gaming to maybe lift your spirits, and it just wasn't working, like what is that sort of change of relationship to gaming like? Um, well, so in my opinion, that's actually been the most devastating part of depression for me is that just losing that love for really anything, games or otherwise. Um, but it's especially hard, you know, because other people will try to help you if they, you know, they see you're feeling down. They'll say, oh, well, why don't you go for a walk or why don't mm. you pick up this game you really like or watch this movie? And, and it's really hard to explain to someone, you know, like, I know you're just trying to help, but it just doesn't feel the same when I do those things. And so to me, that's the most devastating part of depression by far. So, um, you know, a good learning tip for us clinicians, I guess, is, you know, not just to ask about, you know, what is a person getting up to in their day to day life, because they might actually just be soldiering through that. Right, <laughs> and, right. And, and it's more like, well, what's your relationship to it? Like, you know, and, and does it feel like, like it should? Um, Phylum, um, burnout, depression, they, they I, I feel like, you know, um, if you have depression, you might get misdiagnosed with burnout, you know, uh, or vice versa. Like, what's the relationship between these two? I think that's a tricky thing because I think, um, as Stephanie was saying as well, sometimes we want to put things into categories. It becomes easy to conceptualize them. But the way I always think about it is this. Let's say you have a heart attack and it makes you stop you from enjoying the things you used to enjoy. Let's say you were a champion sportsman and you had a heart attack, you can't do it anymore. And you start becoming depressed because of it and losing your enjoyment in life. You won't say that all these three things are all very discrete individual conditions. You would have a holistic view of how all these three things are actually all interrelated. Um, and I think that's, I always wonder whether clinicians, we move away from that because it makes us feel uncomfortable to see somebody as a whole person and to be able to link up the different parts of their lives into a, a narrative of who the person is. And it's easier to go, you have X, you have Y, you have Z. And I mean, even if you look at the burnout categorization, it is a category. It's WHO going, this is Z, whatever code. Depression is F, whatever code. And we are coding them accordingly without giving this ability to sort of link everything up together. Um, of course, as you said, depression, people who have underlying depression um, are likely to... It's, it's that famous thing, isn't it? If you ever talk to... Um, if you talk to somebody about something, they will diagnose according to their specialty. And I wonder whether that can happen as well when we talk about, so if let's say you talk to a psychiatrist about chest tightness, you're going to get somebody diagnosed as anxiety. Talk to cardiologists, yep. you're going to see it's a heart attack. You know, people diagnose- <laughs> You better talk which... to the cardiologist first. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? Um, people always diagnose according to what they know. Um, so if you present with symptoms of lots of exhaustion, lack of enjoyment, feeling of ineffectiveness to a psychiatrist, you may be diagnosed with depression. If you go and see an occupational health therapist, they may say, oh, you have burnout. But the thing which matters more is less of the categories which we are putting people into and more of the symptoms of what they are. So the lack of enjoyment, that's important. The lack of interest, that's important. Trying to get that managed, get that sorted out is more important, whatever the label is. Um, that's, that's my own personal view. I know different people may view it differently, but it's the symptoms and how it impacts the individual that matters more than... Yeah, than I, I'm, I'm sure that like people appreciate being heard and seen and like, you know, uh, being seen as more than a label and being an actual story and, you know, um, but I, I think you know, people also value sometimes having a label saying, okay, now I understand what's going yes. on with me. Yes. Now I understand what yeah. this is yeah. and it's validating yeah. and also... Like, I trust now that the person I'm seeing about this, we're on the same page about what we're dealing with. Yes. That kind of thing. Um, what I wonder about is, like, 
there might be people who think they're dealing with burnout, right? And actually it's something they should be seeing their doctor about. And it's, you know, it's actually, it's depression. And, and, you know, these two might mimic each other quite um, closely. Yes. So, so there's probably like a threshold, right? Like if you're dealing with burnout, obviously try to deal with it within the workplace, talk to your occupational lead and all that. But if it gets to a stage where it's causing you harm, where it's causing a detriment to your life, you may want to consider, you know, medical steps, right? Yeah, I think that's just very good advice, actually, because, um, yeah, I think, again, by the purest form of what burnout is, is related to work. Therefore, theoretically speaking, if you're away from work and you're able to decompress, things should get better. But actually, we find that despite that, you're still feeling low in mood, you're still feeling depressed, you still feel that life is not worth living, that you have lack of interest in what you're doing. I would strongly recommend seeing professional help. It's not to pathologize people's existence, but it's so that people can get help as soon as they can. Um, And and yeah, like, you know, so so a a depression can have these symptoms which feel like burnout. And I I, I don't want to trivialize burnout in any sense either because burnout is serious and it can affect your life, but you don't want to have something as serious as depression and then think, oh, burnout. Right. <laughs> like, like, like uh, there, there are scales to this, and like, depression is a serious mental illness, as we call it, uh, or a mental health condition, and and the and it has treatments. It, you know, you can uh, you can take medication, you can have psychological therapy for depression. Meanwhile, with burnout, I think the question, you know, well, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> let's let's talk about what you do do uh, for for burnout. Um, Stephanie, what is your advice for someone who has developed that this kind of frame of mind towards video games? Like before talking about how they should deal with it, like how what how should they feel about it? Like, well. It's so it's really hard, especially if we're depending on if we're talking about someone who's also dealing with depression as well as burnout, because trying to tell someone with depression, you know, oh, well, just have this mindset, like just restructure how you're thinking. You know, that's kind of the whole struggle with depression to begin with is that, you know, you're suffering from this unhealthy state of mind. And so um, I guess um without getting into practical steps to take, just one general thing that has helped me a lot with my mental state about everything has been just talking to other people uh, who are struggling with the same thing. I know that sounds so, you know, well, duh, but um, it's, it's actually been huge because even if no one's offering any, you know, practical steps to take, like realistic advice, just having other people who are dealing with the same thing, it actually helps you know, the voices in your head telling you like, oh, this is just you. Like, you're the only one who can't keep up. You're the only one who can't blah, blah, blah. You know, so that's that's been very helpful for me um, in managing my negative mindset. And I think that's like a, an important attitude to take about this as well is to avoid self-blame. Um, right. And, and that it isn't a uh, like a personality flaw or a failing or a shortcoming that there's well, first of all, as Phylum has been saying, it's, it's something that is done to you almost by society and the workplace. Um, and so if any if anything is to blame, it's probably your environment. But also it is a it is a mental state. And, you know, we were allowed to feel um, not ourselves. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's um, kind of the main thing um, that I have to try to tell myself over and over is that I'm allowed to feel things. I guess if I were to point to one repeated phrase that I have, it's always, no, you're allowed to feel this way. It's okay to feel this way. Other people feel this way, you know? So mm-hmm. that's the mindset that I try to keep for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely okay in the sense of like, you know, it's not morally wrong or like a failing, but, but also, right. you know, it would definitely be far more okay to feel good, I guess. And so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong; it would be totally better to not have to deal with it at all. But I just mean, totally. When I say it's okay, I mean it's not. You're not failing. Yeah. Yourself by feeling that way is what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So, let's let's think about someone who does want to get into that more okay frame of mind, like you know, like. Okay, let's let you know someone who wants to sort of work on it. 
and and you know that sounds difficult right what sort of things would you suggest or have helped for you well if we're talking about um specific to the game burnout um and i guess this could probably be applied to other things too but um for game burnout one thing that has really helped me um was to actually go back to something that I really loved back at a simpler point in time. So part of the problem is that there's all this pressure to try to keep up with all the new releases, make sure you're writing enough, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you would think that spending the time to go back to you know, a game that you played 10 years ago would not be helpful whatsoever to your job. You know, um, the way I was thinking about it before was, I can't spend the time on that. You know, I don't have time. I have to keep up with X, Y, and Z. But I did find that once I actually made myself just, you know, turn off everything else and go back and try to get into the magic that I fell in love with so long ago, um, it actually led to me having an easier time playing the new games and spending time on that. It, it actually made me feel less burnt out. So um, that was definitely a big step for me. And, you know, I sometimes get cynical about like pe telling people like, oh, take some time for yourself. Like it sounds like the most obvious thing, right? Uh, yeah. And and it sounds maybe like like you say when people say, oh, go take a walk or or, or right. go play this thing you'd like. It, it sounds a bit too obvious, but there is a f mindset where you forget that you're allowed to do that, or not forget, but like it doesn't even enter your view that this right. is a thing that you're allowed to do is take care of yourself and do something that you enjoy. And so it is something I think that people actively have to remind themselves and then try and act on. Yeah, and I, th I think it's less... So I gave, you know, one example of going back and revisiting an old game, but I think it's less about, you know, specifically doing that and more about just trying to feel okay with doing something that's going to help you. I know that sounds so simple, but um, mm. at least for myself, I've always just, I, I always try to tell myself I don't have the time or, you know, I just, I can't do it for whatever reason. I'm always providing some kind of rationalization in my mind why I shouldn't go do it. But I think that's the biggest step, honestly, in helping with this whole mindset. I, I mean, I agree. And like, I, I don't think I've ever experienced burnout as such, but like, I do get into these frames of mind sometimes where everything I do has to be productive right like, exactly like, and so you sort of feel guilty for taking any time to do something that isn't productive and I think going back to older games there is this whole thing as well of just like it being tied to a time in your life maybe where things were simpler like you weren't such a um a workhorse for example and um, I mean, it's not true of all games, but like nowadays, like if I'm thinking about going back to an old game, it's a game that's like less online and less achievement orientated. And it's just something that maybe has a purer form of engagement. It also reminds me of like nostalgia therapy, which people talk about in terms of like the nostalgia of games is helpful too. Sorry. But, but, okay. Uh, sorry. I was just going to um, add one more super quick thing. Um, like, Oh my gosh, now I just lost my train of thought. Okay, never mind. Continue, please. Ignore oh, me. Oh, I don't know if it was to do with like going back to a simpler time or, for, or enjoying oh, right, the right. yes. games. Yes. Okay, so part of going back to a different game, um, I mentioned that, you know, back when you were in love with it and such. But another part of it is actually that you know exactly what to expect in those games. So that, because um, I also deal with, you know, anxiety, and that's part of what can make newer games difficult to keep up with for me um so if you go back to something you're used to um that can definitely also be like a major thing that's helpful mm. definitely um i want if i um i could talk about this actually for a while in terms of like you know what is comforting in terms of gaming uh but like fine let's just talk about first of all just in terms of the workplace and what we know about um treatments for burnout uh i'm going to as the non-burnout expert here, just guess that we don't have any medications for it and we don't have any specific psychological therapies for it. Um, would I be on the right track? Mm, yes. So there is work being done right now in trying to develop a protocol for it, um, which I have to admit I'm not an expert on in terms from the World Health Organization trying to make a protocol for treatment. But things which have been done within 
different workplaces in trying to address burnout, um, it basically can be split up into three different categories within my head. Uh, the first category is the self-care category. So it's about helping individuals uh, address issues with regards to burnout. Um, I thought it was very interesting, Stephanie, because the first thing which they said, the first stage which they talked about was allowing people to talk openly about the effects which they feel during burnout. That's supposed to be sort of like the baseline thing mm -hmm. that needs to happen in yeah. any sort of in, um, workplace. Um, and it's being upfront about it, saying that, look, um, I'm feeling anxious, I'm, I'm feeling stressed, I'm, I'm having insomnia, you know, fatigue, I feel guilty, and, and being able to highlight that and having that open dialogue with people that is not something which needs to be hidden, um, that people feel the ability to say that I'm, I feel this way. Uh, sometimes the way I think about it is like if you sprained an ankle and you went to work, you wouldn't sort of pretend everything's okay and hobble around the entire day. You would tell somebody, I sprained my ankle, I need to sit down a little bit, and, and no one sort of blinks at all about that. Um, so from the individual perspective, also, we talk about things like, you know, um, ensuring your basic needs are being met because often, like you said, it almost sounds strange. And I thought it was interesting because both of you said the same thing, which is they are simple things, but you often forget it. Yep. So things like eating, sleeping, you know, um, doing enjoyable activities, giving yourself permission to do enjoyable activities, um, that often gets forgotten during burnout as well. One thing which is also recognized in burnout is when people try to cope with it in unhealthy methods, like drinking lots of alcohol to a point where you don't feel like you have to care anymore mm. or working even more hours so that you don't have to think about what you're doing. Um, and it just perpetuates an even worse cycle. Um, and sometimes it's important to ground ourselves on why we're doing what we're doing. What is it that made this an enjoyable thing in the first place? Again, easier said than done. But um, I guess that would try and uh, address some of the cynicism, for example, is try to reconnect yes. with like what brought me to the dance in the first place. Yes. Right? And, yeah. and I thought it was interesting because both of you talked about going back to the past, going back to play games which are more nostalgic, simpler times. And I wonder whether that's part of it as well. It helps reconnect you to what you enjoy about games in the first place um i i sometimes apart from video games uh, i was laughing in my head because um stephanie when you said old games 10 years ago i was thinking skyrim skyrim <laughs> <laughs> that's technically true yes. um but yeah so like i sometimes even read a book which i've read like 20 times over before because it's something about doing an activity like that which feels very comfortable um but yeah, I'll, I'll watch shows that I've seen so many times before because, you know, uh, you don't have to pay so much attention to them and they're just, you know, sort of comfortable white noise yeah. at that point. Yeah, I, I'm on my, I don't know, 20th playthrough of Fallout 4 right now, so <laughs> I have no, not going to say much. But yeah, so, um, but that's the thing which we talk about the individual. But from within the culture of your company, um, there are other things which needs to happen as well. So first of all, you need to have, it sounds strange, it, it needs a top-down approach. Usually they say a lot of initiatives have to be a bottom-up approach where um, <clears throat> change is driven from below. But for, with regards to burnout, it needs top-down. It needs senior management. It needs the managers. It needs, like you said, your boss saying that this, I recognize this is an issue. You are permitted and you're allowed to talk about it. You're allowed to take time off of it. You need that sort of, um, I know it sounds strange because obviously everybody is an independent individual, but almost permission that is okay. Um, and often that needs to come up from within the corporate industry, the, your yeah. corporate structures that needs to happen. Um, staff need to be, we also need to make a culture where people are not afraid of hearing unpleasant things from other people. Because a lot of times when, let's say, um, People are scared of saying that I'm depressed, I'm struggling to work colleagues or to their teammates or to their supervisors because they feel as if it's a taboo subject. And part of it as a culture is to be able to change that culture within your 
your organization that it's fine to talk about it's fine to highlight to your supervisor that you're struggling you need a bit more help as well um so yeah so that's so we talked a bit about the individual thing but we talked a bit about the corporate aspect as well um for bigger organizations i guess you could talk about having occupational health services you can talk about having health insurance to cover for people who need talking therapy stuff like that um, but there's a much bigger sort of uh systemic change which needs to it, be implemented. it sounds uh broadly like the main intervention for burnout is an occupational intervention it's to change the actual stress the the work for example yes and, and it sounds like whatever you do to the person to help them with the burnout, if they're still going to the same job, then it's just going to keep happening. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's I, th- I think, again, telling somebody, don't be burnt out. Welcome back to your same job. I'm not sure that's, <laughs> that's going to be the most helpful sort of interaction of anybody. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you often hear things being bandied about, about resilience, you know, building up resilience among your your team members. And yes, I think building up resilience is important, but I do get worried that it's a byword of, of companies um, alleviating themselves by having responsibility by saying that this is your resilience issue, this is nothing to do with me. When actually if the company itself is the issue, then you need to change the company. I mean, speaking of companies, uh, Stephanie, I was actually, I mean, you've pra- you've praised the gamer and I don't want you to talk about the gamer specifically, obviously, because you work there. But like in general, um, what would you what support would you expect if you were feeling this way from an employer? Um, well, for starters, I guess the main thing would be that I'd want the room to be able to say that I was feeling that way. So in previous jobs that I've had, I, I couldn't even fathom going to my boss and mentioning burnout, <laughs> you know, I would just assume it, it would be, you know, oh, mental mark on Stephanie, you know, she's not good material for this job. And so I've, I've never felt like I had the room to do that before. So I feel like um, as an employee, you should at least be able to talk about it um, in terms of, so if we're talking in the game industry specifically, um, I've had my boss or other coworkers, um, give they've tried to give me tips for how to handle it um they've been understanding if i've had to you know leave for a little while and come back or like spread out my hours a little bit differently depending on what's going on so i guess a uh, flexibility would be if i were to point to one thing um it would be that that's kind of what i would expect from or at least what i would hope to expect from an employer hmm. i think as a as a gamer uh, this is because uh, you were making me think of like first of all how would a streamer want to for example um have the system work that they can maybe take time off streaming and not have the um the algorithm attack them for example and push them down the visibility charts just for taking some time off and as we know like you know youtubers and twitch streamers and are sort of rewarded for always being on uh, and it sort of forces them to keep going and then um, I was thinking in terms of being a gamer, uh, like I used to play um, Genshin Impact when it first came out and just these games that reward daily engagement, um, like, you know, oh, I better log in today and do my, you know, four daily uh, missions to get my Primo gems, that kind of thing, where, um, again, uh if it has that same sort of like work like mentality to it building up where it it could again the opposite being going back to something simpler which is less uh game as service and maybe more story driven or just simpler or something that you may be attached to playing for the joy of it um so so I can definitely see this mentality of what you want from your employer also attaching to like what you want from your game. <laughs> yes. Uh, for example, which makes it makes it sound like some some games are working us perhaps. <laughs> I mean, sometimes sometimes games uh, so w- what you just described with Genshin Impact that is definitely something that would not 
be helpful for me whatsoever. Um, but I've played other games where it feels a little bit like work. So um, Stardew Valley, for example, has some kind of elements of having to keep up like water your crops every day and whatever. And um, on the flip side, I've actually found that to be helpful at times for um, like depression issues, you know, feeling like, oh, I, I at least accomplished this task. You know, I can point to that and be like, well, I did this today. And so I think it just depends on how it's structured because you're yeah. not really you're not really penalized for not doing it, but you feel rewarded if you do it, despite it feeling like a, a task. So, um, yeah, I think it could go either way, depending on how it's set up. I, I think that is the distinction. I mean, I've not played Stardew Valley much, but I, from what I've heard, that is sort of like the distinction of it's not forcing you to do anything. You're sort of like doing what feels good and what works and you know, it's not really penalizing you. And I think the uh, opposite example is Animal Crossing, where, uh, <laughs> again, uh, I I enjoyed it at first and then ended up with a checklist of things I wanted to do every day, like clear the weeds and fish for some stuff and get a get a fossil for uh the museum and etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and it just turned into this treadmill of trying to you know get the stuff and then comparing myself to other islands and thinking i'm not doing enough and that kind of thing so um i think yeah there's there's some things that can sort of like maybe superficially feel fun but the way that they're then delivered to you can end up feeling like work yeah Let's uh, let's, let's just uh, um, begin to wrap up. Uh, Stephanie, do you have any final uh, messages uh, about this subject, like why it's important to you or anything that you want to get across to our viewers? Um, well, the main thing I guess that I would like people to understand is you don't always have to be the standard version of productive all the time. And things that you think aren't productive, such as revisiting an old game or doing things similar to that to take care of yourself, can actually end up being extremely productive, even more productive than you would have been had you not spent the time on those types of things. So that's honestly what I hope people remember the most. And that it's okay to have this as a struggle. You know, some I've heard other people treat burnout as like, you know, they kind of make make jokes about it. Like they take it really lightly. Like, oh, that's just the burnout. But it, it can be a really serious thing and it's okay to treat it like it is. I, I, I hate to make you follow up with something uh, unrelated, <laughs> but I just, I just uh, remembered, did you write about um, using video game soundtracks as a, as a way I to did. Sort of ease your weight? I did. So, so tell um, me about that. Yeah. So um, sometimes when, um, you know, the burnout or depression or overlap of both um, become too much, I have felt too immobilized to even sit down and play an old game that I enjoy. So one of the things that I did um, was just lay down in bed and put on the soundtrack of an older game that I enjoy to get me into that same kind of mindset or same feel from back then without actually having to put in the extra work of playing the game. And mm. even even that was really helpful for me. It got me more in the mood to play more games. So I thought that was a useful tool as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say that it's a, you know, I can't sort of vouch for it from any psychological point of view or anything, but like, I have listened to uh, Breath of the Wild soundtrack, the ambient soundtrack on plane journeys, and uh, and it helps keep me calm on a very noisy flight, and it just brings me back to, uh, you know, the the lovely nice open world of Hyrule. Uh, so uh, you know, these sort of emotional connections that sort of spring up when we hear the soundtracks of games we like. Bye. Um, any final messages from yourself? Although, uh, you know, Steph's final message, you know, that we shouldn't always have to be productive and, you know, we can be other people. Definitely. It's so important. Phylum, any final messages? Oh, it's, it's quite a long way. I do apologize. But um, <laughs> it was what uh, Freudenberger wrote 50 years ago, which I thought was a great quote. So it's not my own thoughts, it's his own thoughts. So what he said about burnout is that... Uh, we would rather put up than shut up. And we what we put up is our talent, our skill. We put in long hours with a bare minimum of financial compensation. But it's precisely because we are dedicated that we walk into a burnout trap. 
We work too much, too long and too intensely. The guilt of not doing enough can then lead one to even further giving. And this in turn leads to ultimate exhaustion. I think there's a really good way of conceptualizing burnout as a entity where you just sort of keep giving until you finally burn out. Um, my final thoughts is, look, if, if you need help, if you need to seek help, do seek help. Um, because again, not pathologizing everything, but there is help out there that can be useful, be it within charity organizations between your local healthcare services as well. Um, and I think it's important to know that you're not the only one who's going through it, that there's other people who are and there's help available for it. And actually, um, that makes me want to thank Stephanie for writing the article and actually writing quite a few articles about uh, sort of the emotional and psychological impact of playing games, because I know uh, that there's going to be people out there who relate and will think, OK, not just me. Uh, and that that's really useful uh, public education. I know it's not intended as education, but that's what it ends up as, right? Um, uh, so go check out that article, actually. Um, I forget the name of it. It's something like how to re rekindle your love or something like that. Or bring back your love of games or something. Uh, yeah, something like that in the face of game <laughs> burnout. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure I could pull up the title off the top of my head either. The the word burnout was not in your article, which oh, made me that? think like, okay. which, which, made, which made me think like, mm, will she mind me interpreting this as a burnout article? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how it was intended. So I'm actually surprised that it wasn't in the title, but. Or anywhere in the article, which is why I thought, oh. like, oh, okay, le left it open to interpretation. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Rezd for letting us talk about this really important topic. Um, and when I say really important topic, I just mean talk about mental health in general. Uh, very cool that gaming uh, venues these days open these sort of conversations. Isn't that awesome? How normal it's becoming. Great stuff. Thank you, Rezd. Uh, if anything that we have discussed today has affected you at all, I mean, Fire's already mentioned, um, basically, don't hesitate to see a doctor if you're feeling unwell. If you are feeling immediately unwell, like you're at risk, then don't uh, hesitate to uh, sh get immediate medical attention or emergency medical attention. If you're in the UK, of course, and you just want to talk about this kind of stuff, you can call 111 and talk to um, a non-emergency line. And yeah, stay safe, everyone. I want to ask uh, if anyone has anything to plug. It, well, we can't plug Stephanie's article because I've uh, rudely and <laughs> forgotten the name of it, and uh, uh, and everyone has. But you can but you can check out uh, all of Stephanie's stuff at the Gamer. But anyway, Stephanie, anything, any social media or anything else you want to plug? Um, plug? You mean provide it right now? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, so um, my Twitter is at Diehard Dragoon, and I would say that's really the only thing I feel the need to point to because the link to my website, well, my website, the gamer's website with my articles on it is on there, and I post most of them on there, so that's probably good enough to cover for me. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's a good Twitter feed, by the way. Check that out. <laughs> you can find us at gaming the mind uh i'm, I'm gonna uh, that's me talking for fire as well because i know fire doesn't have a personal social media and neither do i um <laughs> uh but well not that not that you know about <laughs> well not that you'd want to know about but anyway um yeah so find us at gaming the mind on twitter uh, or at gaming the mind.org and check out what we're writing about, what we're tweeting about. We basically talk about mental health and games. And if this has interested you in any way, you can find more of that uh, over at our place. And we'd uh, welcome you to continue that conversation with us. Fi, <laughs> um, I agree do you have anything to plug? <laughs> I, I okay. agree with everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, Fi, very offline. Uh, so don't, don't check him out. Um, <laughs> sorry so sorry everyone i know you wanted wolf island but that's the end of that okay uh <laughs> thank thank you everyone and have a great rest of rest